Good afternoon and welcome to World Oregon's webinar with Peter Martin. This is China's Civilian Army, the Making of Wolf Warrior Diplomacy. It is Tuesday, November 10th, and we're glad you could join us today. Before we get going and before I introduce Peter, I wanted to talk to you about a couple of things coming up at World Oregon. We've got, well, not unrelated to today's program, we have another program on China coming up on November 30th, a Tuesday, November 30th, 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. It is what is happening to the Uyghur people in China with Rushan Abbas from the Campaign for Uyghurs and Abdul Karim Idris of the World Congress for Uyghurs. So join us for that um, very, very um, important issue that is not getting nearly the amount of play it probably should in the West and hope you can join us for that. Also coming up December 1st, John Gasvinian, a uh, fantastic historian, has a new book. He's gonna join us for a discussion on America and Iran, a history from 1720 to the present. That's Thursday, December 1st, 12 p.m. You can find any of our upcoming programs at worldoregon.org. And we welcome you participating. These are online programs, they have free admission. And it is a great way to keep everyone connected to the world. Um, a little note on today's program. Um, your cameras are off, your mics are off. This is a webinar. You can submit your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. I may drop some things into the chat, like the link to buy a copy of Peter's book, which is fantastic, from our dear friends at Broadway Books. I also wanna thank the Northwest China Council a longtime partner of World Oregon for helping promote today's gig. And I'm glad uh, if you're joining us through the Northwest China Council that you could be here with us. So as I mentioned, this is Peter Martin, China's civilian army. Peter's gonna take a look into the untold story of China's transformation from a semi-communist state to a global superpower from the perspective of those on the front lines, and that is China's diplomats. Peter Martin is a political reporter for Bloomberg News, he's written extensively on escalating tensions in the US-China relationship and reported from China's border with North Korea and its far Western region with the uh, area that we're talking about with the Uyghurs on the 30th. He previously worked for their consultancy APCO worldwide in Beijing, New Delhi and Washington. In Washington, he served as chief of staff to the company's global CEO. His writing has been published by outlets including Foreign Affairs, National Interest, The Guardian, The Jamestown China Brief, The Diplomat, and The Christian Science Monitor. He holds a degree from the University of Oxford, Peking University, and the London School of Economics. And without a whole lot of further ado, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you, Peter, and I'm gonna go off of screen. Well, thanks so much for welcoming me. Um, it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here and uh, I'm going, to, I'm going to try to keep my remarks at the at the top as brief as I can, so that we have um, lots of time for for Q and A. Um, but you know, I, I thought I'd sort of start off uh, talking about why I came to write a book about Chinese diplomats, um, and then and then to talk about some of the kind of key findings um, before we get on to that interactive portion. Um, and I guess the the backstory really is that I arrived. Um, back in China in early 2017, after a few years away from the country. Um, and it was it was impossible really at that time not to be struck by the, the extraordinary economic, uh, technological, military progress that the country was making. You know, China's president, Xi Jinping, was rolling out China's Belt and Road Initiative um, across the world. He was getting ready to announce uh, the, the establishment of China's first overseas military base in Djibouti. China's economy was beating estimates. Um, and, and perhaps most importantly of all, the, uh, the Chinese government seemed to face this extraordinary opportunity um, to step up and take a greater global leadership role um, as a result of the Trump administration's policies. President Trump, of course, was busy picking fights with US allies, attacking multilateral institutions. And that seemed to be this, this chance for China to kind of uh, to step up. But the longer I, I spent in Beijing, the more I realized that while China was you know, tremendously effective 
perspective, um, at offering economic inducements to other countries um, through things like infrastructure spending and investment. And it was also very effective at coercing other countries um, using sanctions, uh, even military coercion to get its way. It, it really seemed to struggle with the, that part of being a superpower and being a global leader which involves persuading others of your point of view, whether that's through propaganda or through the art and craft of diplomacy. Um, and and as, you, as you kind of step back and, and think about the kind of world that we're moving into, this is going to be a, a world where there are multiple centers of power, you know, not just the United States. And there's going to be a premium, I think, on that ability to persuade others of your point of view, the ability to make your case to the world and have others sign on. Um, and, 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 and no one is gonna be able to kind of dictate terms in that way. Um, and the, the more I thought about that theme, the more I kind of came to see Chinese diplomats as a microcosm of China's broader struggle to communicate with the world. Um, and they're, they're a kind of curious, group of people. Um, on the one hand, they are uh, extremely suave, sophisticated, highly trained. Many of them speak multiple foreign languages. They hold degrees from fancy places like Georgetown. Um, you know, they, they can be funny and they, they often know a great deal about the societies um, to which they're posted. But when they stand up on the podium in the foreign ministry, uh, to give press conferences, or when they sit down across the table from their US and other foreign counterparts, they can become quite rigid, stilted, ideological, and of course, in recent years, increasingly belligerent when they interact with the outside world. Um, and so I started to think about, you know, why was that? Why was there this, dis, this sort of disjoint between, um, you know, the skills of Chinese diplomats and uh, their ability to deliver. So I started to, um, to, to do interviews in Beijing um, with, with both Chinese envoys themselves, but also with foreign diplomats who had spent um, decades interacting with their Chinese counterparts. And I started to look for Chinese language sources, which might help me to understand that puzzle. Um, and I, you know, I knew that there were a couple of memoirs written by former Chinese foreign ministers and ambassadors. But as I, as I kind of delved into secondhand bookstores and, and you know, government bookstores and, and, and those kind of things, I found that there were more than 100 memoirs written by former Chinese diplomats, which I used um, really as the main source base for the book that I eventually pulled together. And, you know, when I started out on this project, um, it was a pretty niche topic. Um, uh, but, you know, as the years have rolled on and, and we've heard more and more about wolf warrior diplomacy, we've seen examples of Chinese diplomats um, storming out of international meetings, of insulting foreign counterparts, telling them to shut up, uh, even spreading conspiracy theories about the origins of COVID-19. And, if any of you watched the confirmation hearings that took place earlier this year on Capitol Hill, you'll have seen that from the CIA to the State Department, the Pentagon and beyond, um, China's diplomacy has kind of become a front and center issue um, of US leaders and indeed of, of leaders across the world. Um, but I guess my perspective, kind of watching all of this unfold, um, and, having, and, and having read the memoirs and done the interviews, was that while uh, the phenomenon we now call wolf warrior diplomacy seems very new on the surface, its roots actually go back um, a very, very long way. So when communist China was, was founded in 1949, the new government set up by Chairman Mao basically had no diplomats to speak of. Um, the, the, the nationalist government, which had been kicked out um, there were a few diplomats from its, um, from its foreign service left behind, but um, the communists kind of cast them aside and decided that they were too ideologically impure to represent the new communist government. And that, you know, the new state faced a kind of paradoxical challenge. Um, on the one hand, this was a political movement which had spent 
decades uh, working underground, struggling for survival, uh, being being kind of chased across China and coming close to uh, annihilation. And even as it took power in 1949, the Communist Party had an acute awareness of the, the vulnerability of its rule and the threat that outside influences might have um, on its ability to continue to govern China. Um, but at the same time, as it had this deep suspicion and paranoia about the outside world, the new government also needed desperately to, to build bridges and, and win friends um, outside of China, if only to establish itself as, uh, as the legitimate government there. Um, and so to square that circle, Mao Zedong's um, foreign minister, Zhou Enlai, um, who, who kind of was the, the founding father really of, of, uh, of Chinese diplomacy, uh, he came up with an approach where he said that Chinese diplomats should think and act like the People's Liberation Army in civilian clothing. In other words, they should model their behavior on the revolutionary fighting force which had propelled the Communist Party to victory. Um, and what he meant by that was that Chinese diplomats would be unfailingly loyal to the Communist Party. Um, they would be disciplined to a fault and they would display what he called a fighting spirit whenever China's interests were challenged. And, and with that militaristic martial ethos came a bunch of really distinctive behaviors which have lasted through till today. Uh, so Chinese diplomats will typically stick incredibly closely to official talking points, even when they know that those talking points don't resonate with foreign audiences. They will move around in pairs um, to keep tabs on each other. They will shout at foreign counterparts uh, when they feel cornered or they're worried that they don't look tough enough back home. And they'll elevate even the smallest of incidents uh, in, into, or, or, or perceived slights into major international uh, problems because they worry that they'll be judged as disloyal back home if they, if they fail to do so. And this approach led to displays which we would now call wolf warrior diplomacy right from the outset, especially at times when China's political system um, became uncertain or unstable. So in 1950, Wu Xiuxuan, who was this veteran revolutionary soldier who had a, a bullet scar across his cheek, um, he led a delegation to the United Nations in New York. Um, and he delivered a speech which honestly makes today's wolf warriors look like a bunch of wimps. Um, Time magazine described it as two awful hours of rasping vituperation. Uh, which gives you uh, some sense of what it was like to be in the room with him. Um, and in the, in the 1960s, during the Cultural Revolution, Chinese diplomats uh, handed out copies of Chairman Mao's Little Red Book on the streets of foreign capitals. Uh, they were expelled from countries ranging from Kenya to Indonesia. And they, they got into literal fistfights on the streets of London outside the Chinese representative office. Uh, one diplomat was even pictured wielding an axe um, in the face of protesters outside, outside the Chinese delegation. Um, so that wolf warrior kind of instinct has existed for a long, long time, but it's, it's really important to, to kind of frame it and keep it in the context of an alternative tradition in Chinese diplomacy, which is this imperative for China to win friends and to build influence. And, and Chinese diplomats are capable of using that extraordinary discipline that Zhou Enlai demanded of them and directing it toward charming the world. So in the 1950s, uh, Chinese diplomats kind of set aside um, the ideological expectations of Mao's China and um, the question, the thorny, ever thorny question of Taiwan and, and, and really focused on building up China's influence in the developing world, especially at the 1955 Bandong Conference um, for Asian and African nations, which really saw China uh, win friends for the first time outside of the Soviet bloc. Um, in the 1990s, in the aftermath of the Tiananmen massacre, China uh, kind of took itself from pariah status 
uh, and launched this two decade charm offensive, which um, was extraordinarily successful and ultimately culminated in it hosting the 2008 Summer Olympics. Um, so there are these kind of two tendencies in Chinese diplomacy, um, which cycle in and out over time. There's, there's one tendency, which is to charm the world. And there's another tendency, which is to use wolf warrior tactics to tell the world off. And I think that recently we've seen quite a decisive lurch back toward the kind of combative assertiveness that I talked about earlier. And I think that's really been driven by two things. Um, on the one hand, there's a new confidence in China's role in the world. And on the other hand, there are these enduring insecurities uh, driven by the nature of China's political system, but exacerbated by changes that have been instituted by the current president, Xi Jinping. So I think that the new confidence really started around 2008 after China had hosted the Olympics, but especially after the onset of the global financial crisis. And, and you know, China's leaders kind of looked out across the world and they, they, they perceived a kind of slow and, and fumbling response um, to the, the financial crisis from, from the US government, but especially from European governments. And they kind of contrasted that with their ability to deliver this massive stimulus package to the Chinese economy, which of course went on to create all kinds of problems for China down the road, but at the time was seen as a huge success. Um, and they started to kind of think, you know, maybe we don't need to show the kind of deference that we've shown the West in the past. Maybe we don't always need to ask for permission and perhaps our system has something going for it um, where it can stand on its own two feet. So that led to a couple of years of, you know, increasingly assertive, uh, even, e e e even aggressive diplomacy on China's periphery uh, in the kind of 2008, 9, 10 period, which really was doubled down on and became more consistent and more forthright after Xi Jinping became party boss in late 2012. And, you know, under Xi, um, China's political system has uh, become an increasingly tense and even scary place. Um, she launched a sweeping anti-corruption campaign, which has punished more than 1.5 million officials and has treated political disloyalty as a form of graft. Uh, he abolished presidential term limits, setting himself up as leader for life. And he's used re-education camps to subdue the far western region of Xinjiang. She has focused on ideology at home and he's used speeches to demonstrate hostility toward outside influences in, in Chinese culture and especially in China's political system. And, you know, when Chinese diplomats and, and indeed officials from across the government see these signals, they see these patterns playing out, they interpret them with a, a, with a kind of historical and cultural richness that many of us lack when we, when we see them. They remember what it was like to grow up in the shadow of the Cultural Revolution. They know that oftentimes when uh, China's domestic politics have taken a tense turn, it's been diplomats who have been on the front line of purges and crackdowns and whose loyalty to the motherland has been suspected. Uh, indeed, in the, in the Cultural Revolution, uh, things got so bad that junior Chinese diplomats uh, locked Chinese ambassadors in cellars, they forced them to clean toilets, and they even beat them until they coughed up blood. So uh, they know exactly how high the stakes can be when you get on the wrong side of Chinese politics. And so as these diplomats uh, watched Xi Jinping implement his agenda, they watched him talk about how China was moving closer and closer to the center of the world stage. It was standing tall in the East. Um, it would never truck uh, foreign interference or bullying, would never give up an inch of territory. China was moving toward the, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. All of these themes that Xi has so consistently emphasized in his presidency, they started to mimic that same tone in the way that they spoke to the outside world. 
And if they were ambitious, maybe they added a little extra twist just for, just for good measure. Um, and so their, their desire to kind of follow this new assertive approach in, in diplomacy was driven, um, I think, by ambition, but also by the fear of what might go wrong if they failed to do so. Um, and this, this new tone um, really went into high gear after the corona, coronavirus pandemic broke out. And so China, once again, found itself under attack for, for covering up the origins of the virus. But also, this new confidence was on display as well, um, as Chinese leaders looked out across the world at the inability of North American and European governments to stop the spread of COVID-19. And they contrasted that with their own ability to, to use um, methods of social and political control to, to put a stop to the spread of the virus. And the result, I think, was a series of outbursts um, very much cheered on by President Xi Jinping, who apparently issued a handwritten note to the foreign ministry calling for more fighting spirit from his diplomats. And if there's one figure who kind of epitomizes uh, this shift in Chinese diplomacy, it's one of the current foreign ministry spokesmen, Zhao Lijian. So Zhao um, was a relatively obscure figure who was posted to the, the Chinese embassy in Islamabad. Um, and he got himself into a Twitter fight with uh, former US national security advisor, Susan Rice. And, and, and doing so kind of rocketed him to domestic fame in China. And when he, he returned to Beijing from his posting in Pakistan, he was even greeted by a small band of junior Chinese diplomats who, who literally applauded his return to his, his office. And he was appointed um, spokesman for the foreign ministry, making him one of the most high profile um, representatives of the Chinese government to the world. And Zhao has used that position to um, anger pretty much everyone who's come across his path, but perhaps most provocatively to anger uh, the Australian government, uh, tweeting doctored images of, of Australian troops um, committing human rights abuses in Afghanistan, and um, e even using his Twitter platform to, to accuse the US Army of deliberately spreading COVID-19 in Wuhan and starting the global pandemic. Um, but, you know, Zhao, um, while he's kind of become the face of these wolf warrior diplomats, he's not alone. Um, there's a whole cast of, of characters who, who employ very similar tactics. Gui Tongyo, who um, was until recently China's ambassador in Sweden, was summoned to the Swedish foreign ministry 40 times in the space of two years. Um, for, for his provocative behavior. And, and when Swedish media asked him about uh, his outbursts in an interview, uh, Gui said, for our friends, we have fine wine and for our enemies, we have shotguns, which, which gives you some idea of the, the confidence with which he has embraced this, um, this kind of assertive turn. Um, and it's, it's important to remember that not everyone in, in Chinese diplomatic circles likes this new turn. Um, Yuan Nansheng, who is China's former consul general in San Francisco, has warned about a trend toward extreme nationalism in Chinese foreign policy, um, which risks alienating the world. And even, even Xi Jinping himself in a, in a Politburo study session earlier this year, talked about the importance of cultivating a lovable image for China, which I think was at least a, a sort of modest recognition that, um, that China and its diplomats have, have come across as more frightening than lovable in recent years. Um, but, you know, as I said at the outset, um, anyone who's delved into the history of Chinese diplomacy um, will, will, will quickly discover that this kind of abrasiveness, this fighting spirit has been there right from the start of, of PRC diplomacy. Um, and, uh, and with that, may maybe I'll pause here and we'll turn it over to, um, to q and I'm looking forward to this a lot. Right, <clears throat> thank you so much, Peter. Um, again, if you joined us midway through, um, I'm Tim DeRoche, I'm the Director of Programs here at World Oregon. Uh, please put any questions you might have. I see we have a few coming into the Q&A 
box on the Zoom screen, put them down there. I'm gonna start things off with a kind of a little, little rejoinder, uh, tracking back on some things you were talking about. Peter, you draw many parallels between current Chinese diplomacy and Mao era sort of demands for political and party loyalty. So are we observing history repeating itself or are there some certain characteristics that make contemporary wolf warrior diplomacy unique? I'm also curious how the younger generation of public service minded Chinese relate to this ethos. Uh, yeah, all good questions. Um, you know, I, there's this there's this quote which um, is often attributed to Mark Twain. I don't know if he ever said it, but um, that the history doesn't repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes. And I think that that's the right way to think about um, what's happening in China now. It's not a reversion to the Mao era, um, but but there are there are aspects of what's going on which kind of have eerie parallels and and, and rhyme with it. Um, I think that, you know, the, the, the big thing that, that the, those two eras have in common is that there's been this focus on a single top leader in China, Mao Zedong, Xi Jinping, um, a cult of personality that's begun to form around that leader, and a focus on the central role that China plays um, on the world stage, and a desire on the part of diplomats to kind of play up to that in order to further their careers, but also to stay safe. Those things I think are very, very similar. What's changed of course, is that whereas under Mao Zedong, the country uh, had a really fledgling foreign service, um, which really, you know, rewarded political, um, in ideological conformity above all else. Now, those things are still important, but, but China has a pretty professional foreign service made up of highly trained individuals who, as I said earlier, you know, they speak foreign languages, they've, they've lived abroad for, for, for many, many years. Um, so that's, that's kind of, um, that's changed a great deal. And I, I, I think that, you know, as I was saying uh, earlier, there, as different as China's political system is to, to other countries, um, there's, there's, there's something to the idea that, you know, those who are drawn for, to diplomacy, whether they're American or British or Chinese, believe in the ability of, of countries to persuade others and believe that that's a noble calling, just as people who join the military believe that, you know, uh, being willing to sacrifice their lives is a, is a noble calling and a way to serve their countries. And, and I think Chinese diplomats believe the same thing. And so, although they've, they've kind of adopted this, this very assertive tone, I think beneath the surface, there's, there's quite a lot of misgiving. And, and a lot of that does have to do with the fact that they understand the societies that they've been posted to far, far better than their predecessors did. Well, so you mentioned um, Chinese diplomats fomenting COVID conspiracy theories storming out of meetings, um, um, even, you know, essentially ripping Secretary of State Blinken a new one. And wolf warrior diplomacy is, can really, really be seen as this bullying uh, sort of diplomacy. So what is it really getting them? Is there other true benefits in this approach? And how is this really playing out? And are there perhaps some lessons in this um, for the West? Yeah, I mean, so what, you know, one of the things that's interesting um, when you talk to Chinese diplomats about this, or you, or you read some of the speeches that that top Chinese diplomats have, have given, where they address this topic of wolf warrior diplomacy, our perspective from the outside is that China is being aggressive and, and bullying, uh, with you know, with some justification. Their perspective is that it's it's China that's being bullied and ganged up on. Um, you know, they, they kind of feel like uh, they get criticized for their human rights record, for the direction their political systems taken, for their economic policies, for their foreign policy, you know, you name it, the West has something to say and, to, and something to criticize China about. And they feel like they're defending themselves and, uh, you know, that they have every right to do so. And that the, the, the response of the West to them defending themselves is to call them names and describe them as wolf warriors. I'm not saying I, I buy into that narrative, but that's kind of their perspective. And it's, it, it's quite easy to, to lose sight of that um, when, when you just observe them from, from the outside and, and you don't see that stuff. 
But um, in terms of what it gets them, I don't think it gets them very much. I mean, I think that the Wolf Warriors have done a good job of communicating China's red lines, which, I mean, frankly, you know, Taiwan, Tibet, South China Sea, these kind of things, everyone kind of knew them to begin with, but maybe the Wolf Warriors have made those red lines even thicker and even redder. Um, and, and, and they've done a relatively good job of, of making clear that there will be consequences for countries that cross China. But I think on the whole, if you look at polling um, that, that's come out in recent years, there is this very deep and very widespread backlash to the idea that, that China has been bullying the world. Um, and I think the Wolf Warriors have really kind of put a human face on um, a much broader pattern of Chinese assertiveness, um, you know, from, from its military behavior to its behavior on its borders and its economic policies and so on, which were already alarming to the outside. And so, you know, I, I would say Wolf Warrior diplomacy is a, is a net negative for China. Well, so does Wolf Warrior tone frame China's ambitious moves into places like Africa and South America? And is there some sense that Belt and Road is going to soften this kind of uh, approach? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, like I, I was saying before, ch ch China is um, China is actually really good at that economic inducements piece, you know, offer, no, understanding that the size of the Chinese market and um, the scope of its global commercial ambitions gives it huge leverage. Um, and it's used that very effectively in, in Africa and Latin America. And, and actually oftentimes, um, especially in the African example, wolf warrior diplomacy hasn't really been a feature of what it does there. Its language is still about cooperation and working together. And it's, it's you know, implementing economic projects, which, which are aimed at winning over local elites. And, and that's been, relatively successful so i don't i don't know if it's um if it's a question of of uh those tactics um blunting wolf warrior diplomacy so much as it's kind of that's that's a separate thing that china does really well whereas the the art of persuasion as i said is is kind of on a different track and china china kind of struggles with that piece well you know my my dear departed mother used to say it is important to be nice but it's it's nice to be important but it's important to be nice do does charming the world and wolf warrior diplomacy, do they need to be mutually exclusive? So I, I kind of think of, of wolf warrior diplomacy as a tactic, right? So China's always had this tactic available and even the most charming and effective of Chinese diplomats at times will resort to, to, to wolf warrior tactics. So I think of someone like Toi Ting Kai, who was until recently China's ambassador in Washington, an incredibly effective, urbane and persuasive person um, who has many decades of interacting with Westerners and, and really does a nice job of, of kind of making China's case and, and connecting with US political elites. But he, he, even Tsui, when he feels pushed, is capable of going red in the face and shouting at American counterparts, just like the, 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 uh, the wolfiest of the wolf warriors. Um, and, and, and so it's kind, of, it, it's kind of a tactic that's become more prominent in recent years. But as I was saying, it's not, it's not new per se. It's just become um, a little bit more dominant in the way that China presents itself. But it'll, it will always sit alongside that kind of charm approach. And, and if you watch the speeches of Xi Jinping, uh, you'll see that when he talks to forums like Davos or uh, you know, big international meetings. He has this person, he wears a suit. He has this very kind of uh, ameliorative tone. He talks about China's openness, the opportunities it presents, how China wants to cooperate with the outside world. When he talks to domestic audiences, he puts on the Mao suit and, and, and talks about, you know, I think he gave, he gave a speech a couple of months ago where he said that, you know, the opponents of China will find their heads bloodied and, yeah, it, it, you know, there's just this really extraordinary language, which is quite the opposite um, effect. And, and so those, th those two things kind of coexist in um, uneasily with each other. And we just have to make the best of the, the, the signals that we're given. Well, so Xi's recent speech before the UN General Assembly was, I mean, you could call it a wonderful hallmark card of multilateralism and dialogue and cooperation. But in the long run, 
What's your thought on how much change we will see from Beijing in their outward engagement? And is this just a kinder, gentler post-COVID China trying to cozy up to the world for the 2022 Olympics? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would say actually that that UN diplomacy, the, the, the way that he talked to that forum is pretty consistent across Xi's tenure and indeed across multiple generations of, of Chinese leaders. When they, when they show up for international audiences, they tend to take on that tone, which is aimed at reassuring the world. The problem is that their speeches to domestic audiences are, all, are also reported by the outside and watched closely. And, and there they take quite a different tone. And so, uh, you know, they, they, they try to keep those two worlds separate, but, but, but it's not an easy task. So we have a question coming in. What do you think about the infighting between Zhang and Xi factions in advance of the potential third term for Xi? And what are the repercussions and or compromises for the country? And what could the repercussions for foreign policy be? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't follow um, Chinese politics as, as closely as I used to. And um, I, I, I published a story this morning, actually, uh, for Bloomberg, which kind of detailed how the CIA is is also on the in the dark about what's going on at the highest levels of, of the Chinese political system, and so it's uh, I, I want to be careful not to be too um, speculative. The, the 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 smartest people I speak to um, seem to have kind of moved away from this model, which which people used to have for two competing factions inside the Chinese leadership and towards a, a model which is much, much more focused on Xi Jinping and uh, it kind of endorses the idea that he has become the dominant figure in Chinese leadership. And that like any leader, uh, even the most powerful of, of dictators in the 20th century still faced forms of resistance, if not organized opposition. And Xi is the same, he's overseeing a a continent-sized country with a massive um, government apparatus, which is very unwieldy and difficult to control. But he he has become, and his, his his person, his office has become kind of the organizing principle of Chinese politics. And I, I don't know that there's much um, left in terms of organized oppositional factions. It's it's more kind of systemic inertia. Um, but but like I said, you know, I don't I don't follow this as closely as I as I used to. So. In September, the New York Times published an interesting article on how the Chinese are turning away from English and the West and becoming increasingly more insular. How is this playing out for Western educated Chinese that want to work with the administration? And is this influencing diplomacy and its recruitment in Beijing? Yeah, um, I mean, I I don't know that we, we know exactly how that will that will impact the way that diplomacy is conducted. It's probably more of something where we'll see the impact in a couple of, in, in a generation or so. But in, in general, um, Xi Jinping's administration has, has wanted to focus on Chinese culture, uh, on what they call China solutions to global problems, on Chinese traditions, um, both communist party traditions and kind of um, thinkers like Confucius and, and all, all of those kind of domestic influences and to want to play down um, the role of outside influences. And you can, you can make a case about why that's completely implausible, given the fact that Karl Marx was German and lived a long time in England. Um, and, you know, com communism wouldn't exist without, um, without outside influences. But, but Anyway, they, they, they try to present things in those terms and, and under Xi, there has been a, a bit of a sort of nativist turn in, in the way that um, the cultural policy is set up. And I think that owes a lot to um, a desire to uh, exert greater control over of Chinese society and, and uh, yeah, and, and, and politics. So one of our questions earlier uh, was not so much a question, but a comment brings up uh, the question of Taiwan. Uh, that they were on track to unite with Taiwan peacefully and it's now seeming like it is moving away from a, uh, an organic and peaceful transition. What is the read from uh, you and your colleagues around how this is gonna play out? I, mean, I, I think that the, the truth is that no one knows, probably including people in, um, in Beijing, how this is gonna play out. Um, they, they did believe for a long time that they would be able to um, 
persuade Taiwan to, to reunify peacefully. In truth, I think that that has not really been a realistic option um, since Taiwan democratized. Um, it's uh, become increasingly clear that the, the Taiwanese public is opposed to it. And given that the, the Taiwanese public gets to choose its own governments, I can't, I can't foresee a way in which, um, which reunification would happen peacefully, certainly, certainly without some pretty radical changes in, in Taiwan's domestic politics. Um, I think people in Beijing haven't completely given up on the idea that some mixture of persuasion and maybe economic coercion and incentives might, might get there eventually, but I think there are a lot of people who also believe that force will be necessary long term. Um, they are also aware, however, that launching amphibious uh, landings on offshore islands is, is notoriously difficult, as the history of the 20th century uh, shows us, and that they still face an incredibly um, competent military adversary in, in the shape of the United States, which would possibly, probably intervene in, uh, in a conflict with China to invade. So I think the hope is that they can build up their capabilities to a point where the US would be deterred from intervening um, and where the options uh, for Taiwan to, to kind of go it alone were, were pretty implausible. But I, I don't think we're there yet. You know, um, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, General Milley, recently said that he doesn't see an invasion happening in the next 24 months. And I think that that's kind of on the on the conservative side. I think that there's still quite a long way to go before China feels confident in its ability to, to do that. Well, as an aside, uh, World Oregon's Young Professionals host a biweekly discussion group where they take a piece of long form journalism and people can read it and join a discussion coming up on the 21st of November at 11.30 a.m. You can go to worldoregon.org to find this. They are looking at T-Day, the battle for Taiwan, a recent long article that Reuters put out. So if you wanna dive into the conversation a little bit more, it's a, it's a good way to do that. So Peter, China is so often portrayed as an economic aggressor and often you know, even a pariah in the news. Does this upset the inner circle of power and who do they turn to and who do they count as their trusted allies in moments like that? Uh, yeah, I think it does upset the, the inner circle. Um, it doesn't upset them enough to change their policies or behavior. Um, and I think that there's, there's quite a widespread belief in Beijing that eventually as China grows more economically and militarily powerful, the rest of the world will kind of fall into line. Um, but, but, you know, it does, it does upset them for sure. They, they receive, um, clippings from international media, which, which kind of guide them on what's going on in the outside world. And, and they don't like to see bad reports, unfortunately, um, the, for them, uh, <laughs> the international media is, is kind of out of their control. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's fair to say that it, it does upset them when, when China is presented as a, as a prayer. Can you remind me of the, the second part of that question? Oh. Yeah, who who do they turn to as their ally? I mean, who oh, do they yeah. consider their their friends? Yeah, so this is this is something where um, there's a standard Washington D.C. talking point, which is to say China has no friends and allies, and this is a great you know this contrasts with the the great strength of the United States, which is its alliance system, which is true, but I think tends to um, downplay. The, the influence that China has been able to build and, and garner. Um, Cambodia in Southeast Asia has, has gotten very close to China and it's not a powerful country, but it is able to play a kind of spoiler role in the association for Southeast Asian nations and, and stop them speaking out against China when it comes to South China Sea. Hungary in Europe, plays a similar spoiler role. Not a country that's setting Europe's agenda, but it is a country with veto power over a lot of important decisions. And it's, it's kind of also done Beijing's bidding for it. Pakistan is a country which um, is providing China with um, kind of 
uh, as close to Beijing has as an alliance relationship. There doesn't, there's no official alliance, but they're incredibly close. And Pakistan has Beijing's back when it comes to its regional rivalry in South Asia with India. Um, North Korea actually does have a kind of out, uh, outdated legacy uh, military alliance with Beijing and, and presents leverage for, for China in its relationship with the United States. And probably most importantly, but also contentiously, Russia. Um, there's, there's a lot of debate about whether, you know, how close is the China-Russia relationship? And I think it's true to say that there is kind of mistrust beneath the surface, but every indication um, that I see suggests that the countries are moving closer and closer over time. And, and I think one of the best indicators of that is the military relationship between the two. Um, until about 10 years ago, Russia was, was pretty wary about selling um, China its most advanced weaponry, and it has disposed of that um, concern. It now sells Beijing the best it's got. It transfers military technology to China and engages in a, an increasingly widespread array of military exercises with Beijing, which I think shows that it has decided that even if, even if China does pose some long-term threat to Russia, uh, their interests are more aligned than not. And so, you know, that's kind of my long-winded way of saying it's true. China doesn't have an alliance system like, like Washington does, but it's got some friends who can be useful and, and, and difficult when it needs them to be. Well, is there any speculation that you were hearing about in terms of the Taliban government in Afghanistan and what that might look like for any future diplomatic relations with China? Yeah, I, I thought that some of the reporting on this um, got got Beijing's relationship with the Taliban kind of slightly wrong. Um, Beijing's overriding priority is uh, is stability on its its western border when it comes to Afghanistan. It doesn't want the country to be a staging board for terrorist attacks in China, um, which is you know, a, a real concern that they that they have. And it wants to be able to continue its kind of economic agenda in South and Central Asia. From that perspective, China is willing to work with anyone who um, is amenable to its interests. And one of the first things that it got out of its talks with the Taliban was a promise that Afghanistan wouldn't be used as a staging board for terrorism in China directed at, at the Chinese government. Uh, so but this is often sort of conflated with there's there's an alliance between China and the Taliban. I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. It's kind of Beijing faces a thorny situation and doesn't doesn't have many qualms about working with the Taliban. But it's also it's also wary of them. It it, it understands that the legacy of um of of that country's use as a as a base for for terrorism and, and it worries about that in its own context as well. So a little note to audience out there, I have posted into the chat, again, a link for Peter Martin's book, if you want to read it. It's a fantastic perspective on everything that we've been talking about. Uh, it's uh, our friends at Broadway Books. We love supporting them, local independent bookstores. So check that out. I want to take another question from someone in the audience. It seems that the whole wolf warrior approach is supported and fostered from the top down. Are there ameliorating factors in the Politburo and Central Committee that might move the country to a more cooperative approach? Um, I think the truth is that we, we don't know um, if there are voices in the Politburo and Central Committee which oppose wolf warrior diplomacy because those people don't feel at all empowered to speak out. I mean, it's it's it sounds like the, the questioner knows quite a lot about Chinese politics, and it's remarkable when I look back, even a decade ago, um, you had uh, Chinese leaders like Wu Banguo and Wen Jiabao offering directly contradictory public statements about the future of China's political system. And that, that kind of, I mean, it was never that open, but that kind of, in relative terms, open public debate has almost completely vanished when it comes to the most sensitive issues in Chinese politics. And that includes um, Chinese diplomacy. Uh, Xi Jinping has kind of set the tone that he likes. Um, a few retired diplomats 
uh, and and foreign policy scholars in Beijing have spoken out against that, but I haven't seen any senior figures um, deviate from the line that Xi Jinping has set. And I think the truth is that they don't feel like they can safely do so. So a question about youth. Um, certainly with Hong Kong, we heard a lot about you know youth movements, but how are millennials and Gen Z in China engaged with the system? And are, are they are they positioning themselves in any sort of international conversation? Are they being groomed for any pathways to diplomacy? I'm just curious about that. Yeah, you know, it's, as you know, it's, it's such a difficult question to address because China's population is so huge and it's so hard to generalize. And, you know, young people in rural areas feel differently to young people in the cities and educated group you know you, you you get it with those with those provisos i think that what what we can observe from chinese young people online and and, and you know interviews i've done and things in china i, I kind of feel like there's a there's a lot of patriotism and a lot of pride on the part of a lot of chinese young people um which sometimes manifests itself in in hostility to the us and the west um but sometimes is 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 manifested in, in, in quite understandable pride in many of the things that, that China has achieved. I think that the challenge for Xi Jinping and the rest of the Communist Party leadership is to make sure that that patriotism always serves the interests of the, the Communist Party. Um, the most dangerous moments in, in Chinese history have tended to be when the, the government is seen as um, having gotten on the wrong side of China's national interests and China's national pride. And so he, she, she has given speeches where he's talked about the need for constructive patriotism and, you know, loving the motherland and these things. And it, what he kind of means by that is loving the motherland, but loving the Communist Party at the same time. So I'm curious about, since we're talking about, you know, millennials and Gen Z, how is social media changing dynamics? I mean, Chinese diplomats and the foreign ministry were fairly late in the game to Twitter, which ostensibly is banned, but how is this changing or reshaping things in, a, in, in terms of their, their global outlook? Um, I mean, in terms of reshaping uh, Chinese young people's outlook, I don't, you know, chi China kind of has its own social media conversation, which takes place under rules largely determined by the Communist Party. Um, so, you know, there's, there's debate and there's criticism and people use code words to say um, uh, critical things about the government and you can still get a sense of some online debate, but really relative to a decade ago, the space for free and open conversation online by young people or anyone else has been, has been shut down and the ability of, of Chinese internet users, unless they are really determined and they want to go out and get VPNs that allow them to jump over the Great Firewall, their ability to engage in global debates using global platforms like Twitter is really, really limited, um, which makes the, the Chinese foreign ministry's embrace of Twitter all the more ironic. Um, and in their desire to do so is kind of rooted in this perception that they have, um, where they, they talk about they, they use this clunky phrase that they, they call discourse power. And they say that the West has a lot of discourse power and China doesn't. And what they mean by that is that the most powerful media institutions in the world uh, are run out of the United States and to, you know, to some extent other Western nations. And from their perspective, those platforms serve the interests of the governments, of their own governments. And that when they try to speak to the outside world, their words are kind of filtered through the prism of Western media, which distorts it and 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 doesn't and 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 paints a bad picture of China. And again, that's that's their perspective, not not my perspective. But uh, that that kind of makes Twitter quite an appealing platform for them because it allows them to speak directly to the world without being filtered through the media. Which incidentally is exactly the same reason that populist politicians like social media because they they too can evade. Um, uh, mainstream media outlets but I, anyway um i think i think that 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 kind of gets to a bit of china's approach to, to social media so you hinted at this a little bit but i'm wondering if you can um maybe elaborate a little bit more but what is the read and the reaction for the chinese on the u.s north korea dynamic uh 
in terms of uh, maybe you can uh, elaborate a little bit. The, the, well, um, the, I mean, we, we you know we we saw that this this sort of dallying with you know some sort of diplomacy under the previous administration. Mm. What's what? Where do they see their role in terms of? Uh, do they feel? Um, are they a, are they an observer? Are they a broker? Um, are they are they picking sides? Are they placing bets? Yeah. So I think that, um, that there's not there's not a great deal of uh, kind of closeness on, on either the popular level or even the political level between China and North Korea. Um, with Chinese citizens think of North Korea as kind of a, a time capsule which allows them to travel back to China's you know dark days under Mao Zedong and, and China's leaders think of the kind of brinksmanship of, of North Korean nuclear diplomacy and, and these kind of things as, as really kind of a pain for them and something that doesn't you know it threatens the, the West but it also threatens China North Korea sits right there on the border with China um, but I think you know China's interest is 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 kind of rooted again a little bit like I said with Afghanistan in stability, right? The the worst thing that could happen from China's perspective is that the North Korean government collapsed and a flood of refugees went. They can't they can't go south through the demilitarized zone into South Korea. They're going to go north into an area where China has a great deal of unemployment and worries about its own political and, and social instability. And so China's interest is kind of to keep the two sides talking to gather whatever leverage it can um, from those talks and, and to make sure that it kind of come, you know, that, that things work out in a way that's the China's interest. But on the whole, I would say that the, um, the Chinese leadership thinks of the North Korean issue as a pain in the behind. So the previous, U.S. administration viewed diplomacy often through a, it's a somewhat zero sum game of winners and losers. And in essence, brought us back to a pronounced great powers scenario. I'm wondering if you are feeling more hopeful from moving away from uh, a sort of Cold War 2.0 and what, are, what, is, what is your thought on where we are going currently with, with regard to U.S.-China relations? Um. I mean, I think that the Biden administration has pretty wholeheartedly endorsed that view of great power competition. Um, it, its tactics, uh, you know, how, the way that the U.S. will conduct itself under that comp uh, that competition is going to be quite different. President Trump was focused on being tough in in the U.S.'s bilateral relationship with China. President Biden is much more focused on working with U.S. allies to to change China's behavior. But, but the, the overall premise that China is a strategic competitor of the US uh, and, and presents the largest foreign policy challenge that the US is going to face this century, I think is, you know, remarkably similar over the, across the Trump and the, the Biden administrations. Um, in terms of whether it will turn into a Cold War, I mean, in, in, in some ways it, it already is, but this Cold War is going to look very, very different to the last one. Um, what's, what's very different this time, of course, is that in last time, the world uh, divided into two blocks, which were implacably opposed to each other, and where there were very few shades of grey, if you were in either of those two blocks. Now, you face, uh, we, we face a situation where we have two superpowers whose economies are deeply intertwined and interconnected, um, and also whose, whose allies and friends uh, are, don't uh, kind of break out so easily into, into two clear, neat blocks. Um, and, you know, if you look at the way that, that the Biden administration has worked with the European Union, with NATO, with Quad nations with the Five Eyes countries, you know, all of the, the, the recent AUKUS deal with the UK and Australia. Really, it's about stitching together um, messy and overlapping coalitions of the willing. And so, from that kind of interdependence piece, and then the, just the messiness of friends and alliances, if this is a new Cold War, it looks very, very different from the last one. Great. Thank you, Peter. We are coming up on our time. Um, I want to thank everyone who joined us today. Again, um, we've been talking with Peter Martin, the author of China's Civilian Army, The Making of Wolf Warrior Diplomacy. 
You can pick up a copy from Broadway Books here in Portland. Um, support your local independent bookstores and, um, and good independent thought. Um, it's been a great conversation. I also want to thank the Northwest China Council for helping uh, bring to today's program together. Again, a couple things to look out for. Our young professionals are hosting long reads on uh, the 21st of November and looking at Tea Day, the battle for Taiwan. And that is 1130 in the morning. This is, you can find this at worldoregon.org. Also on the 30th of November, what is happening to the Uyghur people in China with Rashan Abbas and Abdul Karim Idris? So if you want to dive more into China related topics, those are two ways to do it. I want to thank you again. This will be posted on YouTube if you want to share it with friends. Um, as always, uh, stay safe, be well, and thanks for helping us connect Oregonians to the world. Peter, thank you for your fantastic perspective. And hopefully we'll see you um, again soon on the uh, World Oregon stage, whether that be virtual or in person. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much.